Good morning. It's so wonderful to see each and every one of you out here this morning, especially to our visitors. We're especially glad that you're here, and we are off the invitation to be with us any in the opportunity that you have. Open the song this morning will be page 148. Page 148. We would ask at this time, if you would please, uh, to silence any noisemakers or any other devices that might uh, disturb worship at this time. We will make a few additional announcements uh, following uh, this morning's service as well. But before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, Father, we are eternal grateful, Father, for once again you have blessed our lives to wake up this morning, Father, to come here, Father, to worship you, Father, in spirit and truth, Father. We hope, trust, and pray, Father, that our service today, Father, will be acceptable and pleasing in your holy and divine sight, Father. Father, we thank you so much for the blood of Jesus, Father, and what it means to each and every one of our lives, Father, that he shed his blood upon Cabbage Cross, Father, that we all may, Father, found life within you, Father. And Father, as we continue this service today, we pray our focus will be on you, Father, that we would put those things to the side, Father, that uh, in our everyday lives, Father, that may distract us at this time, Father, and we pray that I worship to you, Father, that as we lift your, your name up, Father, in songs and hymns and and prayers, Father, and, and all that we do here today, Father. Father, we're so blessed, Father, to live in a time in a country where we are able to worship you, Father, without fear of, from the government or interference. We thank you so much for the men and women, Father, who have protected those freedoms of, so much in this country, Father. There are many of in our brotherhood, Father, that do not have these freedoms, Father, and we pray for their continuous, Father, faith in you, Father, that they will live their lives, Father, as you will have them to do. Father, we pray for our ministers here, Father. We thank so thankful to have good ministers here, Father, and Gary and Derek and, and Ed. Father, we pray that you continue to bless each and every one of them, Father, and the things they stand in need of, Father. Father, we ask you to continue to be with them and their families, Father, as they minister here, Father, as well. Father, we ask you to be with Gary, Father, as he comes forward, the violence breaking unto us the word of life, Father. Father, we pray that you give him clear members of the things that he has studied, Father, always helping him rightly divide the words of truth, Father. Father, we ask you to be with us in accordance with this service, Father. Forgive us, Father, when we fall short of your will as we return and repent of those things. It's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. Good morning. Hallelujah, praise you.
Say verses one and three. No. Gotta say all three first. All three first.
Our scripture reading this morning will be from Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8, if you'd like to read along. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather here this morning and to worship you. Uh, we're so thankful for Jesus, for the life he lived, for the examples he gave us, for his, his teaching, and for his willingness to, to die for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we do ask that you help us all to strive to be more like Jesus every day. We're also thankful for our church family here, the, the love and support we have for each other. Thank you for our Bible class teachers and the work they put into that. Thank you for our song leaders and the talents that, that they have. We also thank you for our ministers and the the work they put into uh, studying your word so that they may bring it to us and, and better explain it to us. Thank you for our deacons, all the work they do. Thank you for our elders and the time they put into leading us and guiding our church. Thank you for all those of our church family who do so many things behind the scenes. I ask you to bless all these and, and their, their families, dear Heavenly Father. We would like to remember those of our church family um, who are dealing with health issues. Uh, please be with James Leggett and his, his upcoming surgery. Um, thank you for Ron Porch's uh, surgery going well and, and continue to be with him as he, as he recovers. Please be with Mike Posey and his upcoming surgery and be with Kyle's aunt Laurie and her and that family as they um, and give them, strengthen them and, and all these others and others who may um, also be dealing with health issues. We also want to ask that you be with those who are struggling spiritually, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, help us to say and do the right things that may strengthen them and help bring them back to you. Please be with Gary as he brings the lesson to us this morning. Uh, Help us all to clear our minds so that we can focus on, on worship, worshiping you and, and the lesson this morning. Thank you for all you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. It is good to see everyone this morning. Before I go any further, I want to uh, say I really enjoyed our gathering yesterday. It was a very uh, profitable time together. I enjoyed getting to sit in a close uh, relationship to several people in some of our discussion uh, sessions. I got to know them the way they thought, maybe a little bit better. And they may have gotten to know me a little bit better. It was very, very enjoyable uh, to be a part of that. Now, as one of our shepherds said, uh, we've got to do something with it now. And I think that's right. We, we can't just uh, have learned something and then do nothing with it. It won't be valuable that way. So we want to go forward. But it's very, very good uh, to be together. I uh, appreciated Corey for two reasons. Great scripture reading. He did a good job with that. But number two, I appreciated the prayer. And he, he brought out some things that, that we need to remember. Uh, I pray for this uh, group of people, the whole church, uh, pretty much every day. I, I won't guarantee I, I don't miss a day, but if I do, it'd be very, very rare uh, that I did. And in the process of doing that, I specify a number of sick that we have, and that includes uh, uh, many of, of the members, and it includes both uh, shepherds of the past and shepherds of the present. Uh, for example, you know, uh, you got to keep uh, Paul and Joanne in mind, and Bob and Mary in mind, as they struggle with various things, and Terrell and Virginia, see, that's another shepherd of the past that we got to think about, but Today, I especially appreciate the fact uh, that uh, Corey mentioned James Leggett. James is a, one of our very, very good uh, shepherds serving faithfully here. Uh, he's a lover of the truth. He love, loves God's people. Uh, he's one of those guys I can count on. If I look his way during a sermon, I can check and see, did I say it right or not? Because he'll either be nodding his head this way or he'll look really puzzled, one or the other. Or maybe even uh, nod his head in the negative. I hope not, but it could happen. But uh, he, he learned uh, just in the last few days that he's got a, uh, a tumor, a growth in his kidney. They're going to be removing that, uh, I believe, October the 5th. I believe it's the date for that. We want to keep him and, of course, his family in prayer on a regular basis. Prayer is powerful. And it, uh, someone says, well, I don't know. I, I, I guess I can pray for you. That, that, that's the least I can do. No, brethren, that's the most you can do. Uh, because God Almighty is the one to whom we direct our prayers through His Son. And when we do that, uh, we have an access to the very throne room of heaven. It's the most you can do. So please remember that uh, and be thankful. Like when Ron Porch comes through in good shape, be thankful. Don't forget to tell God thank you when he's answered us. But on the other hand, don't forget to pray uh, when we know something's coming up. There are others that we need to remember as, as well. When I think about our prayer life around here, I, I think about what a wonderful, wonderful family we have. We do. We've got, we are blessed. You cannot imagine, if you've never been there, you cannot imagine how a distant some groups of people who claim to all be part of one church can be. Uh, they can be terribly distant and terribly uninvolved with one another. I'm thankful to say that Siwell Road is a real family. Now, we are like all families. Occasionally, we slip up. We make a mistake. We don't do something as well as we could have done it. But all in all, we're a family. And I thought it was important as we continue to look at some basic fundamentals of faith that this morning we look at some things in God's family there must be. And among those are sacrifice. In the book of John, chapter 15, Jesus is talking uh, to his disciples. And as he talks to his disciples, he is laying out some very important matters. He's already told them 
that he is the vine and they are the branches. He's talked about the importance of being in him uh, so that you can bear fruit, and we must bear fruit uh, to be pleasing to him. And now in verse 9, he goes on to say, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, I want to ask a simple question of all of us. Is there a greater sacrifice that could be made than to give up your life for somebody? I think the answer is so obvious, you almost, I don't even almost have to answer it myself. No, there is no greater sacrifice. Jesus came to this earth to make that sacrifice. He did that out of love. And he talks about that in numbers of places, you know, probably the most famous of which is John 3.16. But it's not the only one that we could talk about. His love for us caused him to sacrifice his very life. Now, realizing that, brethren... Don't you think it's important that we also should be a people who sacrifice? Turn with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Corinth was a, uh, an interesting place, uh, known really for its immorality. In fact, it was known all over the world for that. If you said someone lives like a Corinthian, you really were saying uh, they're pretty wicked, <laughs> They're pretty evil in what they do. And, and yet, Paul went into that uh, particular city, and the gospel had a powerful effect on that city. Many, many people obeyed the gospel. A, a great church was formed there. But that church struggled. It struggled with making the transition from being worldly-minded and thinking about the things of this life to becoming a people focused on uh, being like Christ. Uh, within that city, there was a lot of idolatrous worship. In fact, the temple of Aphrodite was there, and so, uh, so they had a lot of immorality associated with that kind of thing. If you went into what we would call the butcher shop uh, in Corinth, it was not uncommon, in fact, it probably was almost totally common, that the meat that was there had been sacrificed to an idol. That is, that the animal out of, out of which the meat came had been sacrificed to a false god. The Corinthian brethren all understood that that god was not the god. But some of them had not grown enough yet to understand that that God was not even a little g God, and that, that it really didn't matter whether the meat was offered to that God or not. Now, in that background, here comes the Apostle Paul, and in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, he writes this, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. Now here, what's he, what's he doing? He's talking to the, to the meat eaters in the church. Now, I'm not talking about physical meat now. I'm talking about he's talking to those who have grown in their knowledge of the Word of God, so that they're not just feeding on milk, the milk of the Word, they're feeding on the meat of the Word. And to those people, especially, he says, we all know there's only really one true God. Well, even the weaker people probably knew that, and Paul states it that way. But now watch verse 7. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. 
for some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. What's he saying? He's saying when they eat the meat that's been offered to the idol, they feel like they're worshiping that God, false God though it may be, little g God though it may be. They still struggle with that. And if they eat that meat, thinking that it's offered to an idol, why then they think they're sinning. They violate their conscience. So what does Paul urge the brethren to do? Go down and start now at verse 11. And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Now stop a minute. Jesus gave up his life for that brother. That brother still needs to grow. That brother is, is not as well developed spiritually as we hope that he will be one day. But Jesus gave his life for him. So, watch Paul as he goes on. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Jesus died for that fellow. Jesus died for that, that woman. And since he died for them, I cannot afford to do anything that would cause that individual to sin, even if it is just a sin against their conscience. I can't do that because it will weaken their faith and hurt the Lord. And so, verse 13, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So what's he saying? I'm willing to sacrifice. I'll sacrifice something that I know I have the right to. In this case, talking about eating meat, eating a good steak. Let's put it in terms we understand. But he says, I'll give up steak for the rest of my life if that'll help my brother go to heaven. That's the point. Now, that is somewhat difficult to translate into our era because we don't have people that do that as a general rule. Uh, we may have people that only eat vegetables, but as a general rule, they don't think it's a sin to eat meat. And so they don't, you don't violate their conscience by eating meat. They're just not going to eat any. But let's think about some other things. For example, I know that there are brethren, and I don't know of anybody here like this, so I'm not using a, a Silo Road example, but there are brethren who believe it's wrong to eat in the church building. That's what they think. Well, in Mobile, Alabama, we worshiped with a, a fellow that everybody called Shorty. I never did quite figure it out. He was 6'4". I think it must have been some kind of a joke, you know, because he sure wasn't short to me. Uh, but anyway, that's what we all called him. And I noticed Shorty didn't ever come to our fellowship meals. One day I said, Shorty, why don't you come to the fellowship meal? And he said, because, Gary, there are some folks here that think it's wrong. They think it'd be a sin to do it. As long as they're here, I'm not going to go to the fellowship meal. Did he sacrifice? Well, yes, he did. He sacrificed the time he could have been with all of us. He sacrificed the opportunity to eat some really good food that some of the other, uh, other sisters and brothers may have cooked. But he did that because he didn't want to wound the conscience of his brother. Was the brother who wouldn't eat in the church building right? Of course not. Now, how do I know that? Well, that's pretty easy. Uh, there's a church that met in the house of Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, do you suppose Aquila and Priscilla never ate in their house? I doubt it. I expect they ate every day in their house. It's, re it's not really a very valid point to make, but people feel that way. That's their conscience. And so think about your brothers and sisters here. Is there something that may be a matter of choice that somebody here thinks would be sin, would be wrong? If that be the case, then should I be ready to give it up, if need be, for the sake of that brother or sister? The answer to that is easy. Yes. So sacrifice is a part of what 
God's family must be. But if you sacrifice, then you've also got to be willing to surrender. Listen to him, Philippians chapter 2. And I'm not going to do what Corey did. Corey did correctly. He read it from 3 through 8. But I want to start with, with 5 through 8. And the reason is because we see, we see the surrender of Jesus, and it's very clear. But once we see that, then I want us to look back and see our surrender. Because it's actually in the two verses that Corey read before, talking about the surrender of Jesus. Listen to him. Start at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Did Jesus surrender? Well, he surrendered to the will of God. You see that in, in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 26, when he prays, not my will, but thine be done. What did Jesus want? Did he want to go to the cross? I think the answer to that is no. He did not want to go to the cross. He didn't want to go through that suffering. He didn't want to go through that death. I think that the Garden of Gethsemane makes that pretty clear. But he surrendered to the will of God. For what purpose? For me and for you. Now, back up and look at the verses that Corey started with, verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of the others. Now, that last statement is, is uh, somewhat interesting, isn't it? Paul assumes that we'll all look out for our own interests. And I think that's a pretty good assumption, don't you? You know, when you get hungry, you're going to look for something to eat? You, well, I can nod my head this way. I don't know whether you can or not, but I can. I'm going to try to take care of, of my needs. If I cut myself, I'm going to try to doctor it and put a Band-Aid on it or something like that. I look out for my own interests. But Paul is using the importance of what Christ did to demonstrate to us what we ought to do. What should we do? We ought not to do things through selfish ambition. Now, what is that? Well, defined by Reinecker, it is the ambition which has no conception of service and whose only aims are profit and power. In other words, I don't care whether I ever help anybody. I just want to get rich and be powerful. That's a worldly way of looking at things. Paul says, don't be that way. But instead, think about other folks. And who's the prime example of that? Why, Jesus is, isn't he? Now, I want us to think about the church here, about the family of God. And I want us to, to ask ourselves this question. Is assembling on Sunday night important to at least some members of the church? I can argue, and I believe I can sustain it, that it ought to be important to all members, but it is important to some. Why is it important to them? Well, they want to worship God, yes, but they also enjoy the being together, worshiping together, lifting up our voices together, praying together, uh, offering uh, voices of concern to one another in certain situations. So, that being the case, do I care more for me or for them when I decide, you know, I'm not going to bother to be here tonight. I don't really care. 
Doesn't really matter to me. Who's the focus there? Me. Who should the focus be? Remember, surrender. Surrender what you want, and instead of that, uh, do what's beneficial for the brother or the sister. Now, in the next chapter, interestingly, Paul goes on to talk about surrender that involves our eternity. And here's the way he says it. He's just listed a bunch of, of the things that, that uh, Jews would have thought were pretty outstanding in his life. And then he says, verse 7 of Philippians 3, But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Why, Paul? That I might gain Christ. Why do I surrender in this life what might really matter to me? Because I want to go to heaven. That's why. So, in the family of God, there must be sacrifice, there must be surrender, and then there must be submission. Now, really, sacrifice and surrender are elements of, guess what? Submission. They all really go together, don't they? Look now at Matthew chapter 26. We alluded to this a few moments ago. Listen again to Jesus' prayer. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He thoroughly submitted to his Father. Turn to the book of Hebrews with me, if you will. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, the writer of that letter uh, talks about these very matters. When in verses 8 and 9, he makes these statements. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all who obey him. Notice he learned obedience. Now wait a minute. Did Jesus have to learn obedience like a little baby does? like a young child, you know, as a child begins to grow up, you know, they finally begin to recognize what no means. Uh, I can remember vividly, don't remember which child, and not, I wouldn't tell you if I did. But in our household, I remember vividly that Teresa said, don't do that. And I remember vividly that child turning and a big smile breaking on their face as they then reached out to do exactly what she said don't do. Did that child know what mama wanted? Uh, yes, that child knew. What did the child have to learn? Well, uh, Miss Teresa made sure that child got a lesson in who do you listen to around here? Your own ideas or mine? Authority. You know, let's yield to authority. And we, they've grown up to submit to authority, we're thankful to say. Uh, therefore, they don't end up in bad places uh, because of that. Well, what about us? Did Jesus have to learn submission? Did he have to learn to obey? No, no, no. Instead, the idea here is he learned the cost of obedience. While he understood and always obeyed the Father. I mean, think about him at age 12. Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? That's in Luke chapter 2. So he knows how to obey, but he didn't know how much it could cost, how painful it could be, until he submitted to the Father and went to the cross. Now, what about us? Do we need to submit? In the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, the apostle says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. That word subject, you know what a synonym for it is? Submission. Submission. The carnal mind, the mind focused on the world, doesn't understand or know how to submit to God. I think we all understand that. So if we're going to be God's people, what are we going to have to do? Submit to God. Do the opposite of what the carnal mind does. Submit to God. Now, interestingly, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul picks up this idea of submission and talks about it in chapter 5. Now, there, there are folks in here I mean, uh, that uh, they are getting ready to get married, and uh, I don't know what, uh, there are two fellows I know for sure that are engaged and will soon, over the next you know, number of months, be getting married. I, I don't know if they're going to insist on this or not, uh, but I've had young men come to me and say, you got to read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, in the wedding. Well, I always do. But I explain it. And I want you to look with me at the explanation, because it's in the text. And we'll look at that first, and then we'll look back at the verse. Here it comes, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning of verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The church submits to Christ. Why? Well, we've already seen it. He died for us. He surrendered his life for us. We ought, therefore, to be submissive to him. Now watch verse 21 and then 22. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. All right. What is this idea of submitting? It means to give up my right or my will. In other words, to subordinate myself to the other. That's the idea. Can you imagine what an impact that would have on the family of God at Siwa Road if the first thought of every person who is a part of this body, the first thought were, how is this going to impact my brother? I'm going to give you a couple of things I heard yesterday. If you really are thinking about your brother, when the dismissal prayer said you walk away from your family and friends that you've been sitting around for a hundred years at worship service, and you'll go find somebody that you've never talked to before, and you'll let them know that they mean something to you. You want to get to know them better. You want to be closer to them. Don't you think that's a real application of what we've been talking about? If that's the way we feel about our brethren, if we're going to submit our wills to the benef their benefit, it may be that I don't particularly want to do you know, certain things, but I'm going to do them anyway. Why? Because I, I want to do it for their benefit. That, Teresa is, is uh, my best a helper on this. Every now and then I'll say, Teresa, do you think that I really ought to go to, and I, I'm not going to name something because I'm afraid you all going to think about something you were involved in. Don't want to do that. You really think I ought to go? Here's her answer. I've heard her say it so many times, I, could, I almost could do it like a recording. Well, Gary, if you're asking me doesn't that mean you probably have already decided you ought to go? In other words, I'm just trying to get her to give me an excuse not to do what I know I ought to do. <laughs> That's what it is. Brethren, we've got to think about each other. We've got to submit our will to the others. Why? Because of Jesus. We've got to submit to Jesus, of course, but then we've got to submit to the brethren. 
In the family of God, there must be what? Sacrifice, surrender, and submission. Now, for the person outside of Christ, we've already seen about those inside Christ, that begins with what? Well, we read Hebrews chapter 5, didn't we? It begins with submitting to Jesus, obeying Him. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he simply said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. We don't want you to be condemned. We don't want any brother or sister that's a part of this great family to be condemned. And so if you've struggled with any of these matters, what better time than right now to come while we sing?
Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. Let us pray. O oh, great God, wonderful, marvelous, majestic God of the universe, thank you, Lord, for giving us your Son, Jesus. Bless us, Father, if we partake of this bread as we remember his body. In Jesus' name, amen. The next verse in Luke chapter 19 says, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that there was a plan, a covenant for all. We thank you, Father, that you loved us then as you do now. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as we partake of this cup, which represents that testament in the blood. In Jesus' name, amen.
As this is a convenient time, we will now take up an offering as we have been blessed. Let us pray for that offering. Holy Father, once again, we acknowledge your might, your majesty, and in particular in your hands in the affairs of mankind. We acknowledge, Father, that you directly affect each of us, and we are blessed that you have given us this country an opportunity to provide for our families. Press, Father, this offering as we bring it today for its use and for the furtherance and the glory of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here this morning. Once again, especially to our visitors for being with us this morning to worship our, our God together. Uh, we do have just a few announcements that we'd like to make before we dismiss this morning. Uh, there will be a family picnic this morning following service downstairs uh, for those from birth through the fifth grade, downstairs from the birth through fifth grade. If you're able to attend that, they would love to have you there. Women of the Word and Standing in the Gap will meet September the 25th. Uh, the building opens at 6 p.m. Uh, Bible class will start at 6.30. The ladies will meet downstairs. The men will meet upstairs. Uh, probably in B2. B2. Uh, the men will be in B2. Uh, the first John chapter 3 is the book they're actually studying during that time frame. Kids Bible Bowl uh, begins September the 28th at 6 p.m. at the home of Andy and Delaney. And uh, Dana Delaney, uh, as Kids Bible Bowl, September the 28th at 6 p.m. Ladies' Day in North Brandon, Church of Christ, will be uh, September the 30th at 8.30 a.m. And we have a Congregational Fellowship Meal, October 1st. Uh, lunch will be provided. Uh, we'll ask you, if you would, please bring drinks and desserts, if you would, please. But before we dismiss, if you would, please stand at this time for close the song and closing prayer. Hymn number 99. Kind of nervous about this one. I hope everyone knows it. It's an old one. But we'll see. There's a happy land of
Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare to leave this assembly, I pray, Father, that we lead with love in our heart so that we show no bias towards any man. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we lead with a commitment to teach the gospel as we have opportunity. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for all that you've done and the patience that you show us each and every day. For Lord, I know uh, there are times that we take you for granted. And I pray that we strive to be better Christians as we strive to one day have a home with you. And dear Heavenly Father, we want to pray for our leaders that they lead this congregation. I pray that they grow in wisdom and in strength and they continue to lead in accordance to your will. And we want to pray for our ministers as they labor here with us as well. And pray for our deacons as they do the jobs that are delegated to them that they may receive the support they need to do their task. And we would like to pray a special blessing for all those that are sick. I pray, Father, that we not worry about things that we can't control. And as long as we're in the faith that there's anything, there's nothing that we have to worry about. And I want to pray for the caregivers that's going to be taking care of these people during their time of need. And I pray that we as well can show support and strengthen them through prayer and conversation or whichever way we can. And we want to pray for our young folks, Father, because there's so much going on in this world, and I pray that they yield not to peer pressures. If you have to rid some of your friends, then do so, because your soul is the most important thing that you have. And we don't want you to lose that. And we just want to thank all our visitor, visitors that visited us today. I pray that they come back. And I pray that we all return this evening at 530. And all these blessings, I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.